be on the vine. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in God my salvation. And here's the writer reminding us that even though it feels like everything is stripped away, and I'm sure that for many of us there has been that sense that everything that we always used to look to perhaps for enjoyment and satisfaction in life, when all that is taken away, we still have hope. We can still, as the writer says, rejoice in the Lord. And how are we able to do that? Well, he goes on to say this. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go to the heights. Our only hope, our only strength is the Lord himself. And so we trust together today that we will know the strength of the Lord as we might even be in that barren place that we know his blessing as the people of God today. So we want to praise our God. We're going to sing to his praise the words, very familiar words, praise my soul, the King of heaven. Heavenly Father for bringing us together once again so we can worship you and give praise and thanks for all you have given us over this last week for your love mercy and provision this in spite of all our failings O Lord in heaven let us not only listen to your word this morning but let us hear your word so that we can continue to be faithful to you and live our lives according to your purpose as we continue through this pandemic, help us, Lord, to remember and give praise that everything we need is found in you when we ask for these things in your name. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the progress which is being made with the vaccination program and for the work being undertaken to enable people to receive it. We pray, O Lord, 
that there will be unity amongst our nations during this process and that leaders will come together as one and seek your guidance in the difficult decisions which need to be made. Heavenly Father, we know that our time in this world is not without trouble, for you yourself have told us this, but you have also told us to take heart because you overcame the world. So for those of us today who are perhaps feeling weak, anxious or sad because of events in the last days, weeks or months, let us be reminded that through your prayer and grace, you can give us strength, peace and joy to overcome these worldly troubles. Let us be reminded that through your death and resurrection, we can look forward to an eternal life without troubles. In your name we pray. Amen. We've had a, we have a number of birthdays that we want to join in celebrating with today. And we always enjoy this part of our time together. On Wednesday the 3rd of March, it was Marjorie Little's birthday. Thursday, Chris Hill had a birthday and Alec McKee also had a birthday on Thursday. And today, it's Maria Tatarly's birthday. So, big happy birthday today to Maria and of course to those mentioned. And the birth of little Joel, baby Joel Daniel Fraser on Wednesday. Bumped into Jenny on Monday and I know she was looking so forward to giving birth and really glad to hear the wonderful news. So every blessing to Joel and to mum and dad, Jenny and Andrew. And of course to the birth of baby Ruby McCausland on Thursday granddaughter of Stephen and Geraldine McCausland. And so every blessing to mum and dad, Sarah and Philip. So we want to just say our birthday blessings. And of course, you put in the name to the one that you know. And if you don't know any of them, we'll just say everyone. But I leave that space for you to say what you want to say. Jesus bless you today. Jesus bless you today. Jesus bless you, dear. Jesus bless you always. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give thanks today for all those that we have mentioned, whether they are just setting out on this life's journey or they have been on this journey for many years. May Marjorie, Chris, Alec, Maria, baby Joel, and baby Ruby, and those that love them so much, may they know your hand of blessing upon them this day and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Boys and girls, we're now going to have Dave and Ruth Michael who are going to be taking us further on our expedition. It's Expedition 10, and we're going to look at a good king, a bad king, and a good king, and we'll sing after this all through history. trying to make my floor pot display and I can't get the screws to go in that they just won't go anywhere even when I push. Let me see. Come back. Ruth, you've got it in reverse. Oh. There you are. And how did you know how to do that? I just know these things. I learned how them work. I need help! What's I need, up? I need to put screen wash in because it's all dirty oh, and I can't get the, the bonnet up. The bonnet up? Yeah. You made that look so easy. How did you know how to do that? Ruth, it's all in the instruction manual. Read it. No, 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 Where'd it go? What's wrong? Everything I was working on has just disappeared. It's gone. Hold on. Let me it's have a gone. look. Let me have a look. There you are. All sorted. How did you know how to do that? A guy in broke showed me how to do it. And you learned from him? Yeah. It's amazing what they pick up. Dave, you've helped me with loads of problems lately. How do you know how to solve all these problems? Well, Ruth, I either learn them from people I work with or from the instruction manuals. 
Oh. That's, I really should maybe try that sometime. You should, yeah. Ruth, does this not remind you of a story? Oh, the story in the Expeditions book that we've yes, been reading? Yes, the one about Joshua and the Israelites. The who? Who were they again? The Israelites. You read about them, you know about them. Oh, God's chosen people. Yeah. And they were wandering around in the desert, lost for ages. They were following Moses. That's right. Moses was like the big leader. He was indeed. He led them all the way through the desert. They didn't get to the end of the... It was actually ended up Joshua had to take over, I That's think. That's right, Ruth, yes. Yeah, Joshua was then a leader. And he had learnt from Moses, a bit like you learnt from... Um, your guys in work and they would have learned from the scriptures as well and a bit like you learning from me as well Ruth yeah oh yeah I remember that now that was a really good story it was a good story but Ruth do you think he was a good leader do you think he ever got scared well I know he got scared because I remember a verse and it said in chapter 1 verse 9 it said be strong and courageous because the Lord your God is with you and he told that to Joshua because Joshua was thinking, this is a really big task and I am really, really scared. And so he prayed. A bit like that time you had the job interview. Do you remember you had to really, your, your tie on? I um, was really scared. And before you did your job interview, we prayed to God that he'd be with you. That's right. Because in all those big, scary situations, whether they're big, scary situations or small, scary situations, God could be with us and he can help us just like he helped Joshua. And... He was a good leader because, well, to be honest, they got to the promised land. They, they got did. to where God had promised them they that did. they would get to. Right. Got one basket up. Got that up the other day. Try and get the next one up. Oh. Why won't that go up? I remember Dave did tell me something. I've forgotten. I'm going to have to ask him. Dave! Dave! What's wrong, Ruth? I can't get the screws to go in again. This this wood and these screws, they just don't like me. Are you doing the same thing you done the last time? You see, I can't remember what I did wrong last time. Okay, I'll show you one more time. Let's have a wee look. Yes, yeah, so if you have the drill in reverse, if you put that in to go forward, the screws go in much easier, like my friend from work showed me. See? Oh, and then I can hang my basket You can hang your basket on it now. Oh no, I've forgotten. Oh, Dave! What's wrong with I need to check my oil and I can't remember how to get the bonnet up. Have I showed you? I know, but I forgot. I'll show you one more time. In here. And up. Oh, I knew it was easy, I just forgot. It's all in the manual. Here, read the manual again. I really do, I need to read that. No, no, not again. Why does this always happen to me? I hope Dave can fix this. Dave! What's wrong, Ruth? Do you remember the other day when I lost everything that I was working on and you fixed it? Uh-huh. I can't remember how you fixed it. Um, or if I showed you. I know, but I forgot. I wasn't listening, really. Okay. I'm just so glad that you did it. I'm going to show you one more time. Okay. There you are. Fixed. <sighs> Will you remember that for the next time now? I'm going to try. I'm going to try and learn. Okay. You know what, Ruth? You're a wee bit like the Israelites. Why are those guys that we were talking about the other day? Why am I like the Israelites? Because you didn't learn from whenever I showed you the first time. Oh, why? Because they got to the promised land and they got everything that God had promised them and they were so lucky. But then they forgot that it was God that had given them all those really good things and they just forgot all about God. But Dave, when I asked you for help, you showed me again. Yeah. Did God help them again? God always helps us. Does he always forgive us? God always forgives us. So did he forgive the Israelites for forgetting all about him? He forgives the Israelites. Ruth, he forgives us for all our sins as long as we ask him to forgive us. Oh. So sometimes we are like the Israelites. Yeah. Sometimes we take God for granted. Yes. And we just forget about him sometimes, maybe when things are going really well. And we just forget all about him. 
But he's always there for us. Yes, he's always there. And he'll always help and guide us. Yes, and he'll forgive us for our sins if we ask him to. So that's maybe something we could think about this week. Absolutely. We could maybe ask God for help when we feel scared, or we could ask him for forgiveness when we forget all about him and we forget all the good things that he has given us. Maybe we should sing a song now. I think we should. Let's sing. Yeah. <laughs> God again. The Lord is good, the Lord is strong, and we will live our lives for Him. We have a number of announcements that we would like you to take note of. Youth Fellowship for all the young people in year 8 and above, that's happening tonight at 7pm via Zoom. And if you need more contact, could you please get in touch with Helen Hooks, Chloe or Leah Emerson, Jess Beers, Hannah Clark or Jack Wright. The Listener Brain Church family will be meeting together via Zoom this Tuesday for their prayer meeting at 10.30 and Bible study at 11. And St Andrew's folks will be meeting for prayer this Thursday morning at 10 o'clock via Zoom. And if you're not already plugged into a small study Bible group, whether that's in Listener Breen or St Andrew's, could I encourage you to consider getting connected to one? It's a great way of staying connected with others, developing deeper friendships, reading and studying the Bible together and praying for one another. 
And if you're not yet in a small group, do get in touch with us. We'd love to encourage you to get involved. The book club's going to meet again via Zoom on Wednesday evening, the 31st of March at 8 p.m. And if you'd like to find out more, again, get in touch and the details you'll find on the screen. We'll continue to live stream our services at 11 o'clock via the St Andrew's Facebook page and over the telephone line using the same number as on the screen until lockdown measures have eased. And please share those details with others. And given the current lockdown restrictions and the impact this is having on many people, can I encourage each and every one of us to play our part in reaching out to others in the church family and the wider community, whether that's through a telephone call, a text message, write a letter, send a card, or whoever it might be, it will really mean the world to others and to let them know that others are thinking of them. And if you need help and support in any way, could you please contact either your elder or Christine Tagley, Mark, or myself. And then in relation to Project Hope, as we see the progress being made in the redevelopment of the St Andrew's Church building, we're putting together a team of people from across the generations, and we want them, and they will be preferably considering the best ways to use the new building and to develop existing ministries or think about new ministry opportunities and to seek for further ways to engage with the church family and the wider community, of course, with the good news and the eternal hope of Jesus Christ. If you would like to be a part of this team going forward, could you please get in touch with Mark? Tagley is now going to come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Sam. So as Sam was mentioning before, it has been a year that we have been in lockdown and the word that we left behind is not there. So let's use this time to pray to God and to pray for others. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful for your love. We are grateful for your grace. And we are grateful for your providence. We are in death to you for the sacrifice of your son. We are in death to you for our life and we are in death to you for the way that you have carried us during the last year. Father, we are praying for those that are struggling. We are praying for those that are facing isolation, for those that are facing mental issues, and for those in which this third and fourth lockdown have been a bit too much. Father, we are praying for your grace. We are praying for your church to keep contacting them, to keep loving them, and to be present in their journey. Father, we also pray for our province, and we are praying especially today for our children for those between P1 and P3 as they prepare and they are really excited to go back to school tomorrow. We are praying for all the health. We are praying for all the preparations and we are praying that as they prepare to go back to school, that you will give peace to moms and dads, that you will Give them the ability and the joy of praying with friends, having fellowship with their colleagues, and enjoying a bit of normality of going back to school and seeing their teacher. We are praying for all the primaries across the province as they prepare to open the door for the children. As Father, as we read on the news, and we read on the news across the borders and across the ocean as people move away from you. And we are praying for this culture that try to cancel anything that is close to you. And they try to cancel your word, they try to cancel the message, and they try to cancel every single person that stands for your gospel and stand for your truth. We are praying that you will be with them. You are praying that you will give us bravery, that you will give us wisdom to speak, wisdom to proclaim, and wisdom to preach the gospel. 
Father, in a world that is full of darkness, in a world that lacks hope, in a world that doesn't see the end of the tunnel, we are praying that you will manifest yourself, that you will be with us, that you will strengthen the church. And Father, last but not least important, we are praying for our brothers and sisters across the globe. We are praying for the persecuted church. And we are praying also, Father, for those that through the means of the internet and the online service have finally met you. We are awaiting for the moment when we can see them face to face, for the moment when we can hug them, and for the moment that we can welcome them into your church, into this temple. But Father, as they have encountered you in this distance, as they have encountered you through the online services, we are praying that you continue to strengthen them, that you will help them to leave the phone and contact us. And we are praying that when the church is open, when the temple is open, that they will come and we can rejoice as they have met you. Father, we know that you glorify yourself and you act in ways that we cannot imagine. As, as we continue in these weeks of lockdown, we are praying that your presence, your love, and your grace be with, with us all today and forevermore. Amen. And now together, let's sing and worship God.
morning church family, we're Jordan, Stevie and Kyle Dick and today we're going to be reading from John chapter 4 verses 43 to 54. After the two days he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honour in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, then said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. The, then the father realised that he, this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. One of the first fully-fledged celebrities in America was a tightrope walker named Charles Blondin. And on the 13th of June, 1859, Blondin was attempting what no one had done before. He was going to cross the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. A hundred thousand people showed up to watch. Blondin asked the crowd if they believed he could cross. Some shouted, we believe. And Blondin went ahead and crossed the 1100 foot expanse over the churning waters of Niagara Falls, 160 feet below him. Blondin made it across no problem. The crowd was buzzing. They had just witnessed the impossible. So when Blondin asked if they believed he could cross the falls while blindfolded, the crowd shouts, yes, we believe. Blondin crossed the falls blindfolded. Finally, Blondin pulled out all the stops. Do you believe that the great Blondin can cross the Niagara Falls pushing a wheelbarrow with a man in it? The crowd goes ballistic and began to chant, we believe, we believe, we believe. And then Blondin asked a question to the crowd. Okay, who's going to get in the wheelbarrow with me? And the crowd goes silent immediately. No one in the crowd of tens of thousands of fans who moments before shouted, we believe, we believe, offered to get into the wheelbarrow. You see, the crowd was content to be entertained by signs and wonders of this remarkable tightrope walker, Blondin. They were happy to remain part of the crowd and allow their emotions to be stirred up. But when it came to putting their faith and trust in this man and actually getting, putting their life in his hands and getting into the wheelbarrow, they backed away. Their faith in him was not genuine. As we come to the end of John chapter 4 this morning, we see another crowd of people whose faith was not genuine either. They were sign seekers rather than saviour seekers. And it begs the question, what are we? Are we sign seekers or are we true saviour seekers? Remember that Jesus has just spent two days in Samaria and he then leaves to travel back to Galilee. The time in Samaria was incredible. He had the encounter with the woman at the well as she put her faith and trust in him. She went and told many others about Jesus. It appears that the whole town of Sychar was turning to Jesus as the savior of the world. What was interesting is that their focus was not on his miracle working power, his signs and wonders, but on his words. As John writes in verse 42, they, the Samaritans, said to the woman, we not no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Jesus then travels to Galilee. It's his homeland where he was raised. And yet interestingly, John says in verse 44 that Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Jesus is coming to his own people, knowing that they don't understand him and they don't honor him for who he truly is, the savior of the world. We're told in verse 45 that the Galileans welcomed Jesus, but this welcome was based on all they had seen Jesus do in Jerusalem in the Passover feast. 
If we cast our minds back to John chapter 2, we read in verse 23 that as Jesus goes down to Jerusalem for the Passover, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew what people were like. Their belief in him, like the crowd watching Charles Blondin at Niagara Falls, was based simply on fascination in his miracles rather than a faith and trust in the one who was performing them. And so Jesus comes to Galilee once more, knowing that they're welcome, in stark contrast to the faith-filled response from the Samaritans in the previous couple of days, was superficial, and that these people were sign-seeking rather than saviour-seeking. It's a challenge for all of us today, isn't it? What kind of belief do we have? Are we merely sign-seeking? Is our faith based on the spectacular, the eye-catching, the crowd-pleasing? Are we simply looking to Jesus to do as we ask him to do on our terms, wanting him to entertain us, to satisfy our needs and wants? Is our belief in Christ superficial, on the surface, in it for what we can get out of him? Jesus, I will only trust you if you heal this person for me, or provide this, that, or the other thing for me, or if you help me with this. And if that's the case, what happens to our belief when Jesus calls us to trust and follow him, to walk in his ways even when suffering comes, when what we ask for doesn't come in the way that we wanted or in the timing that we'd hoped for, when the signs and wonders don't materialize in the way that we had demanded, when the Lord challenges us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow him? Do we back away from Jesus frustrated and disillusioned for his signs didn't live up to what our expectations were? Or do we continue by faith, seeking him and following him with all of our hearts because of who he is, the Messiah, the savior of the world? Are we sign seeking today, folks? Or are we truly seeking the savior? It's with this backdrop that we meet a desperate man who has a life-changing encounter with Jesus. But is he a sign seeker? or a true savior seeker? Let's find out. It's as Jesus travels north through Galilee towards Cana that he meets this royal official. John reminds us of the significance of Cana because it's where Jesus performed the first of seven signs that John highlights in his gospel, the turning of water into wine. And now Jesus is about to perform his second sign in the same town, But this time, it's not a wedding which provides the context for Jesus' miraculous sign, but a lone individual with a sick son. We're not told the name of the official who made the journey from Capernaum to Cana to see Jesus, but it's likely that he was part of King Herod's court, a man of high standing in society, probably a Gentile, a non-Jew, and yet a dad whose son was dying. Try to imagine what this encounter must have been like. This man of high standing, a man with money and great power, but the human condition is breaking through into the life of this official, for his child is very sick, and we're told in verse 47 that he was close to death. The man is desperate. Money, power, privilege means nothing anymore, for his beloved son is about to die. He has lost all hope. And then he hears of this man, Jesus, who can perform many signs and wonders, and in a last-ditch effort to save his son, travels to Cana to see Jesus. And as he encounters Jesus, he begs him to come and heal his dying son. In this moment of high tension and emotion, how does Jesus respond? Well, on the face of it, he responds in a way that we maybe don't expect. Verse 48, he says, Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. What's Jesus getting at here? It seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? But Jesus isn't just addressing the nobleman. He's addressing the whole group of Galileans who, like the crowds cheering on Charles Blondin at the Niagara Falls, are simply sign seekers, unwilling to get in the wheelbarrow with him. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Your belief in me is not real belief that honors me for who I truly am as the Savior of the world. And there's a sense here that Jesus longs for the people in his home place to trust and believe in him without the need for the fireworks of miraculous displays of supernaturally impressive wonders. Yes, these signs are given that we may believe, but no, we're not to rely on these signs alone. 
we're always to rely on Jesus himself and his word. As Jesus goes on to say to Doubting Thomas, one of his disciples, after Jesus had risen from the dead and presented himself to Thomas, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. As the apostle Paul says in Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. We live in a world today that is searching for meaning and purpose. People will search in all kinds of areas, looking for special signs and wonders, digging deep into other religions or forms of spirituality to try to find the answers to life's big questions. And yet we have all the answers we need as we delve into the Bible, God's life-giving word. And as we encounter Jesus in the pages of this book, we'll come to realize that yes, he can and does work miracles, for he is God but he is also the savior of the world, the Messiah, the one who has died on the cross and risen from the dead so that our sins can be forgiven and our eternal relationship with God the Father restored. He is our only hope in life and through death and for all eternity. Oh, that each one of us who know and follow Jesus would share with others the eternal hope and peace, the joy and love that we can only experience through Jesus as we encourage others to place their faith in him and to listen and respond to his word. The royal official responds to Jesus by again appealing for help. Verse 49, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replies in verse 50, you may go, your son will live. Then look what John points out in verse 50. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. John realizes that genuine faith is at work in the official, even if it is initially superficial. This man is a savior seeker and not a sign seeker. Jesus does not come with the man as was requested to perform the healing, but only gives him a word. Go home, your son lives. And the man by faith takes Jesus at his word and begins the journey back home to his son. What an agonizing journey that must have been. The official had planned to get Jesus to come with him, but he didn't get the miraculous sign that he had wanted. All he got was Jesus' word. I wonder what that journey back to Capernaum would have been like for this royal official, his heart pounding wanting to take Jesus at his word, maybe saying to himself time and time again, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. More often than not in the journey of following Jesus, this is what happens. As one commentator reminds us, we live by faith and not by sight. We move on the assurance of what we do not see. Even when things around us can seem so discouraging, when the battles we're facing seem so debilitating, when the storms we're journeying through seem so demoralizing, faith doggedly hangs on and seeks the Savior, trusting him and his word. The royal official is met on his journey home by his servants. And John tells us in verse 51 that they tell him that his son is healed and that the fever left him at the same time as Jesus spoke his words, your son will live the previous day. And here once more, we get a faith-fueling glimpse of the awesome power and glory of Jesus, the Savior of the world. He does not even have to be physically present to have a dramatic impact. When Jesus speaks with heavenly authority, there are no spiritual limitations to his power. A dying boy healed with a word over a great distance at once. Such is the power and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And we too can receive his ministry simply through the power of his word. Without him having to be next to us in body, he can be next to us and with us by his spirit. And his word still has a powerful healing, saving impact as we look to him. John tells us in verse 53 that the royal official believed in Jesus and also his whole household put their faith and trust in Jesus also. They truly believed by faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing received eternal life in his name. They were savior seekers. 
So how does this encounter between the royal official and Jesus apply to us today? Well, let me share a few final thoughts. Perhaps today you're going through a really tough time. Or you know someone who is going through major difficulties at the moment in their lives. Maybe you're struggling to overcome an addiction or that sense of failure or insecurity. Or you don't know how to get your life back on track after a family tragedy. This passage encourages us to seek the Savior, Jesus, and encourage others to do the same. For Jesus is the one who is mighty and all-powerful, and as we put our faith and trust in him and his word, he can give us fresh hope, meaning, and purpose for his glory and for our good. Seek the Savior. Or maybe you're listening or watching today and you have some great sadness in your life like the royal official had. Maybe you have a sick child or a sick partner or a sick parent or grandparent. Maybe you have a relationship that is broken. Maybe your job is on the line and the future seems really uncertain. Maybe there's an ominous situation looming on the immediate horizon that is robbing you of your peace. This side of glory in this broken world we're living in, not every sickness will be healed in the way that we want. Not every storm will be calmed in the way that we had hoped. Not every scary circumstance will be fixed in the way that we long for. But every sickness, every storm, every circumstance we face in this world can be transformed into something purposeful, meaningful, a place of significance, growth, and refining through the work of Jesus Christ and from the perspective of God's sovereignty, if we seek the Savior. Remember that it was the anxiety about a son that led the official, the royal official, to Jesus in order to get help in his time of need. Once brought into Jesus' company, he learned a lesson of priceless value that Jesus is the saviour of the world, and he and his whole household put their faith and trust in him. Quite often, it's through our sicknesses, storms, or the scary circumstances that we face that we learn lessons which could be learned in no other way, where our souls are often drawn away from sin and the world, and where we come face to face with Jesus at our point of desperate need. J.C. Ryle puts it like this, Prosperity and worldly comfort are what all of us naturally desire, but losses and crosses are far better for us if they lead us to Christ. So let us beware of murmuring in the time of trouble. Let us settle it firmly in our minds that there is a meaning and a message from God in every sorrow that falls upon us. As Paul reminds us in Romans 8, 28, God interweaves all things together for his glory and for our good. Now, humanly speaking, and I put my hands up when I say this too, this is supremely hard to believe at times, which is why rather than seek a sign, we seek constantly the Savior. We cry out to him in prayer. We listen for his word through the scriptures. We allow his spirit to minister to us, and we put ourselves in a place where Jesus can encourage us and teach us and give an eternal perspective to us and meet us in our hour of need. If you find yourself today in the midst of sickness or a storm or a scary circumstance, don't be a sign seeker. Seek instead the Savior. Turn to Jesus. Put your faith and trust in him and his word and allow him to lead and guide you every step of the way. As a real life illustration of this truth in action, I wanna to read to you a blog post by Tim Chalice. He's a pastor in a church family in Canada, an author and a well-known blogger. And on the 3rd of November, 2020, at the end of last year, his son, Nick, died suddenly, age 20. And here's what Tim wrote the day after his son's death. And as you listen to this blog post, reflect on what he shares as someone who in the midst of the storm, who no doubt yearned for his son to be physically healed, continues to seek not a sign, but the Savior Jesus. He wrote on the 4th of November, in all the years I've been writing, I have never had to type words more difficult, more devastating than these. 
Yesterday the Lord called my son to himself, my dear son, my sweet son, my kind son, my godly son, my only son. Nick was playing a game with his sister and fiance and many other students when he suddenly collapsed, never regaining consciousness. Students, paramedics and doctors battled valiantly but could not save him. He's with the Lord he loved, the Lord he longed to serve. We have no answers to the what or why questions. Yesterday, Aileen, my wife, and I cried and cried and cried until we could cry no more, until there were no tears left to cry. And then later in the evening, we looked each other in the eye and said, we can do this. We don't want to do this, but we can do this. This sorrow, this grief, this devastation, because we know we don't have to do it in our own strength. We can do it like Christ followers, like a son and daughter of the Father who truly knows what it is to lose a son. We know that there will be grueling days and sleepless nights ahead, but for now, even though our minds are bewildered and our hearts are broken, our hope is fixed, our faith is holding, our son, is home. Tim and his wife, in the midst of the devastating storm, didn't place their faith and hope in signs and wonders. If they had, their faith and hope might have been shattered, for their son died. In the midst of the devastating storm, they sought their Savior, Jesus. For their hope and faith is in Christ, his life and his death and resurrection and his word. And it is Jesus who will carry them and comfort them and care for them in all that is to come, both in this life and then in paradise beyond. Only two people ever did come forward eventually to put their lives in the hands of Charles Blondin. Blondin's manager, Harry Colcord, was carried across the Niagara Falls on Blondin's back. And Blondin's nephew himself actually got into the wheelbarrow and was wheeled across. Both of these men had a relationship with Blondin and they trusted him. No sign-seeking stranger in the crowd laid it all on the line and put their faith in Blondin's ability. The royal official was a savior seeker, not a sign seeker. He trusted Jesus' word and by faith, he and his household gave their lives to Jesus, the one who can bring healing with just a word. What about you and me? Are we sign seeking or are we truly seeking the Savior? Whether we're in the midst of sickness or a storm or scary circumstances that threaten to overwhelm us, let me encourage each one of us today, including myself, to seek the Savior, to come to Jesus, to listen to his word, to place our faith and hope in him and allow him by his spirit to lead and guide, to carry and comfort, to love and care for us in these days and for all eternity. Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for what you've been teaching us today. Anything that is not of you, strip it away, Lord. Anything that is from you, help it to settle deep within our hearts and minds. Thank you for your awesome power seen through the miraculous sign of Jesus in this passage, that even with a word, healing can come no matter what the circumstance or distance. Lord, we praise and worship you for your grace and mercy, your love and awesome power. Thank you too for saving not just a boy, but also his father, and his entire household as they sought Jesus as their savior and put their faith and trust in him. We praise you, Lord, for this miracle of new birth and for life transformation. Lord, no matter what our circumstances or the storms or even the sickness we may be facing today, help us to turn our eyes to Jesus, not just to his miraculous signs and awesome displays of power and authority, but to who he is, our savior, our rescuer, our Messiah, the one who died and rose again to bring us life eternal. 
the one who calls each of us to place our faith and trust in him. Help us, Lord, to cry out to him, placing our faith and hope in him and allowing him by his spirit to lead and guide, to carry and comfort, to love and care for us today and in all that is to come. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious and saving name and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to finish together by singing one final time and we're going to sing together a new song that reminds us of our miraculous salvation which comes by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, on the authority of God's word alone, for the glory of God alone. Let's sing together. Through faith alone we come to you. We have no merit we can claim. Sure that your promises are true, we place our hope in Jesus' name. Seek the Saviour, folks. 
A big thanks to everyone who's been involved in the worship service today and to Jordan Dick for helping to beam it out online. Uh, we're so grateful for all that he's done this morning. And if you need help in any way or want to talk about what it means to trust and follow Jesus, or if you need prayer support, please get in touch with us. After the benediction, please don't rush away. Have a listen to the wonderful hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And why not take time then to pray and to respond to what the Lord is teaching you. And even then to pick up the phone or send a text to someone that the Lord lays on your heart. Let's pray together. Father, help each one of us to live each day to the full, being true to you in every way. Lord Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say, for our hope is in him. And we close with the words of the grace together that are on the screen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
tears away. It tears away.